Hi, my name is Cortland Gray. I'm Chief Operating Officer of PV Electronics. We're here with Hartley PV, uh, founder and CEO of PV. Uh, we're coming to you through uh, a virtual seminar. We're here in Meridian, Mississippi, and are happy to do this interview for you guys. Uh, tell you a little bit more about PV, its history, and Hartley's uh, time with us. Uh, 55 years of PV Electronics this year. There's been uh, a lot of great people like Leo Fender and Jim Marshall, Les Paul, who were around from the early days of, of this modern music of rock and roll and such, and you're there as well. You're kind of the one of the remaining people, which would make you one of the oldest people in the music industry, or, <laughs> or rather, the, I'll say the last man standing. Yeah, well, didn't plan it that way, actually. Uh, I had a, a very unique opportunity to grow up in a very interesting place at a very interesting time. That place was in Mississippi, and this thing that we call rock and roll didn't start in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago. It started along the banks of the Mississippi River from New Orleans probably up to maybe St. Louis. Um, my father was a musician. As a matter of fact, he graduated in the middle of the Great Depression and back in the 30s. He couldn't find a job, so he spent four years traveling around the country playing saxophone in a swing band. Uh, he got tired of that because in those days the roads were poor, and he came back to Meridian, Mississippi. He discovered my mother. Uh, they got married in 1939. And I came along in 1941. And what my dad did when he came back to this little town is he started a music store. And I was literally raised in a music store. I had the opportunity to, uh, in a manner of speaking, learn the music business from the inside as opposed to so many people that came in from the outside. And uh, I was born in 1941. And by the mid-50s, I was in my teenage years, and when this thing we call, we call rock and roll started, I was there. I remember uh, the early days of rock and roll. I got caught up in it. And, so uh, were you a musician yourself? Did no, you play? no, no. My, I worked in the, my dad's shop, uh, not necessarily because I wanted to, because he kind of said that if I was going to sit at his table that I would be working in the shop. That's right. And I had mm -hmm. very important jobs such as taking out the trash and uh, repairing automatic record changers. And most people today have no idea what an automatic record changer is, but it's, it was a mechanical nightmare with little gears and pulleys and the arm would pick up and drop on the record and uh, that, was a, that was a job nobody wanted to do, but that's what I, that's what I did. Anyway, I, uh, I, I also sold records and I my father sold records of 45s and long plays and and those kind of things and and I kind of was interested in music from that and what I, kind of records what what genre of music was that well I mean selling? he he served a, a wide thing you know we had people that liked jazz we had people that liked um, swing music and uh, popular music but the hardcore rock and roll really didn't start until about 1955. Okay. And in 1957, uh, some friends of mine and myself, we went uh, south to Laurel, Mississippi to see a guy named Bo Diddley. And I watched Bo up there with his, he was literally playing a, a Les Paul special, flat, the flat top one. And it was covered in rabbit fur. Mm -hmm. He had an amplifier about halfway across the stage, and he did his uh, typical Bo Diddley beat. And I decided then and there that I wanted to be a guitar player. So I go back and, and tell my dad that I want to be a guitar player. And he told me, well, that's not the thing to do. Guitar players are no good. That This rock and roll will never last. And They don't pay their bills either. Uh, uh, well, right. they don't, that, that, well that, unfortunately, I should have listened to him on that one. But... Anyway, I wanted to be a rock and roller, and my dad, he had a few guitars, and I asked him to give me one, and he said, no. He said, if you learn to play, then I'll think about giving you one. But like any kid, I wanted it now. And uh, 
I started taking a few lessons and my dad had a rental program and uh, in that rental program there were these very cheap guitars I think the name of it was Stella and at that particular time in my life I didn't like country music and on the front of this guitar they had a silk screen cowboy <laughs> and I was ashamed for my friends to <laughs> see me so long story short I got old pieces of guitar and, and built something my first guitar was a would you believe a, a, a it was a it was a classic guitar with nylon strings but nobody told me that you couldn't put steel strings on a classic guitar what did so, that do to the bridge so well the bridge just popped off and that was my introduction to guitar repair okay and I had a guitar um, then I needed a pickup so I went to my dad and that at that time the only aftermarket pickup you could buy was made by a company up in Ohio called the Armin it was thirty nine dollars might as well have been thirty nine thousand dollars because I didn't have it so I asked my dad could I have one he said no <laughs> told you you learned to play that guitar and maybe I'll think about it but of course that wasn't good enough for me so I ordered uh, some magnets out of a magazine and I went to the local distribution house electrical uh, distribution house and I bought a roll of the smallest wire that they had which happened to be number 38 which in terms of, of, of pickup is, is pretty big. I, I sat at my mother's kitchen table and hand wound that pickup mm -hmm. and it weighed about a pound Ooh. but it worked. So I had a guitar, I had a pickup, then I needed an amplifier. Dad, I, I, would you give me an amplifier? No. I'll give you an amplifier if and when you learn how to play. Well, that wouldn't that wouldn't do it for me. So, long story short, I built my own. It was not a very good effort. The fact is, I built it off a schematic, and I didn't understand what an RIAA equalization was. And when you plug the guitar in it, it sounded like you were playing through a a pillow. It was a whole pull up. So I fi finally figured out that was. So I I. Um, I re redid the circuit, and it I don't say it was great, but it was okay, at least workable. So mm -hmm. I spent the next eight years trying to be a, a rock and roll guy. I was, I, I was, a, I was a robotic player. Uh, I would sit and take a, a 45 RPM record and slow it down to 33 and very mm -hmm. much like a robot learn each thing it took me a lot longer so you never took any formal lessons I took a few formal lessons but I, I, I didn't want I didn't want to do all that I wanted to play so mm -hmm. so you know went back then and maybe even today if if when you're playing a song if it sounds like the record people think you're good and some of the songs that I played did in fact sound like the record of course it took me three or four months to learn it but and some people actually thought I was good, but the reality is I was a, a robot. So we cannot say you were a natural guitar I player. I was definitely not a natural guitar player. In fact, is I finally got uh, decent enough to get in a few bands. And after I got kicked out of the third band, I decided that my future as a rock star was limited. Mm -hmm. So I'd kind of hung out with musicians and... I heard what they had to say, and basically everybody said, I wish somebody would make good gear at a fair price. And I thought that's, that made sense. And uh, another thing happened at that particular time. Uh, this thing we call rock and roll started, uh, again, in the south, around Meridian, Mississippi, and, and I was there. It was a very exciting time. Uh, rock and roll started, of course, with Elvis and Carl Perkins and uh, Fats Domino and Little Richard and all that thing. But as that music progressed into the late 50s and early 60s, music changed. It, it, the dynamic seminal rock and roll, it kind of went away and what I call little girl music. It had the what we call pretty boy singers, you know, uh, Bobby Beach, Darren. beach uh, Blanket Bingo and such toe tappers as It's My Party and I'll Cry If I Want To. And kids didn't want to hear that kind of stuff. They wanted something they could dance to. 
Well, while this rock and roll thing was going here, the British were very influenced by it, and they kind of repackaged it and sold it back to us in the form of uh, what most people refer to as the British invasion with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and so many of the British artists. And that, that made music explode again, mm -hmm. but even bigger than before. But there was another uh, trend that was very influential in the music business, and that is from the early 60s until probably the mid-70s was the golden age of the conglomerate. And a lot of these big companies that had no particular interest in music jumped into the music business. Most everybody knows that CBS, the, the television people, they bought Fender. Uh, what people don't know is, is uh, Beatrice Foods, uh, you know, nobody doesn't like Sarah Lee, they bought JBL. Ling Timco Vought that made airplanes for the Navy bought Alltech Lansing. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. And what these people did, they bought into the music business because they saw instant money. They came in, they instituted a lot of practices which virtually destroyed most of those companies. Yes, they had the same name, but their passion was not for music. Their passion was for profit. And so and did you see instant money when you started the business no, in 1965? No, no, no. no. Uh, if, if I had any inkling of what I was getting into, I probably would have become a postman <laughs> so that all I would have to worry about would be uh, bad dogs and bad weather. I see. Uh, I jumped in there having no idea what or who I was competing with. The names were there. See, in, in the music business, I've observed that the names rarely change, but the owners do. The personality changes. So since I was raised in a music shop, my dad always uh, told me that the aim is to make a fair and reasonable profit. So I determined to do two things. First of all, to make good equipment at an affordable price, not cheap, affordable. And coming from a retail background, I didn't know that you were supposed to make two, three hundred percent gross margin. I thought if I made maybe 30 points or so, hoping to end up with single digits, that that was it. And that's what I did. It was very tough. I had to figure out different ways to do things that would be more efficient. For instance, back then, the way cabinets were covered uh, let's say you were making a, 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 a column speaker or something. You had the, the vinyl, you had to have a top, a bottom, two sides, and a back. That's five pieces you've got to cut, five pieces you've got to handle. We figured out how to do it with one piece. Nobody had ever done that before, as far as I know. And you think that was more efficient? It was absolutely more efficient. In other words, when I built about five or six uh, sets of, of what we then called a PA system. And, you know, when I first started, I was building combo amps. I had one cabinet and one chassis. But when you got a, a so-called PA system, you got a, an electronics unit in a cabinet. You got two column speakers. And the way they used to build it, they had all these screws. They had 20 or 30 screws in the front and 20 or 30 screws in the back. And it was just a nightmare. We invented a way to, to build a column speaker or a, a guitar speaker enclosure with virtually no screws except to put the speakers in, which they had to go in from the front, and one piece of covering material, no, no screws, because we glued it all together. We put little grooves around, which they called dados. And, we and were you the, doing this yourself at the I, early I, days, I was or how far I was, along was I was it? doing this, and my first employee was a fireman. He was on two days and off two days, and he would, he would help me. And... Uh, we actually made the cabinets in my father's basement at his, in his house. So that kind of got started, and, and I went out and, and sold. Um, I'd build one amplifier a week and go sell it to a music store. And finally, my dad actually sold his music store, the retail part. Uh, he kept the building, and my first little factory was upstairs over his old music store. But, but a company called Mississippi Music had bought my father. And... One day, 
the manager of that store called me. He said, uh, there's some guy down here and he's selling amplifiers and he's telling me that this is the best amplifier in the world. And we don't have a guitar player. You mind coming down here and playing it? And I said, well, okay. So I went down this long uh, flight of stairs and I came in there and there was this great big old roll and pleat uh, amplifier. It had about a dozen knobs on it. Mm -hmm. It was called Custom with a K. And uh, this guy was pontificating about how great this amplifier was. It's the greatest amplifier in the world, blah, 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 blah. And so the, the manager of the store was a guy named Jimmy Ball. So Jimmy said, Hartley, would you mind, you know, plugging in there and tell me what you think? So I went and got a guitar off the wall, plugged in, turned it on, punk, I said, boy, it's mighty noisy. He said, oh, it's got a lot of gain, so it has to have a little noise. I said, okay. So I plugged in and played one of my little signature licks like most guitar players have. And uh, I cut off the switch, and he said, well, what do you think? I said, well, it's okay. He said, what do you mean it's okay? I said, well, it's, it's okay. The truth is, it was kind of dead. But he said, well, what do you mean? This is the finest amplifier in the world. Da, 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 da. I said, well, that's your opinion. My opinion is okay. He said, well, what do you think is better? And I said, well, to be honest with you, I build a few amplifiers myself. And uh, in all candor, mine sounds a whole lot better than that. Well, just roll it up, buddy. <laughs> roll it up here. Let's see. I said, are you sure? And I asked Jimmy, the manager. I said, you? he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went over and got one of mine, rolled it up there, plugged it in played the same little lick and that guy and he had some guy with him they didn't say a word they didn't say hello goodbye but nothing they unplugged that big old custom amplifier and it had caster rollers on the bottom and they rolled it out the door and like a fool I went out there and said mister I didn't mean <laughs> to offend you I'm sorry I, I and, and I looked at Jimmy I said Jimmy I, I didn't mean he said no no you didn't do anything wrong so I said well Okay, so I went on back up to my little upstairs shop, and about 30 minutes later, I heard a knock on the door, and it was this other little guy, and he came in. He says, boy, I sure could sell some of those amplifiers. And I said, well, you probably could, but in all candor, I don't, I don't have enough money to pay you. And he said, well, what about that amplifier? I said, what do you mean? I was fit putting the finishing touches on, on an amp. He said, I could take that and use that as traveling money. And like a fool, I'd never seen this guy before in my life. Like a fool, I gave him the amplifier to pay his expenses. And he was the Don Quixote mm -hmm. of the amplifier business. He went all over the southeast selling amplifiers. I couldn't keep up. I had to hire people and hire people and hire people. And in 1968, we built our first little factory. And, of course, all my competitors said, oh, that guy down in Mississippi is just some redneck. He's nothing to worry about, which was a good thing. Uh, so we started selling amplifiers. And our, the way that we approached things, the different way we, we did things, we had one of the first automatic soldering machines in the guitar amp business. Hmm. Uh, we did things differently because, in many cases, I didn't know how you were, quote, quote, supposed to do it. So we figured out the most efficient way for us to do it. And, that, and, and by the way, that's been a hallmark of PV for 55 years. Instead of copying somebody, like Marshall's first amplifier, was nothing but a copy of, of Fender's uh, 1959 basement. Not many people know that, but that's, that, I mean, it's one for one, circuit for circuit, identical. With different tubes? Uh, no, same tubes. Mm. Same tubes. They later changed to EL34s because they couldn't get 6L6s in the UK, or at least they were very expensive and rare. So I was into it. I, my, my hours, by the way, for the first three or four years were 9 to 1 a.m. A.m. Oh, both a.m. Both a.m. Uh-huh. Uh, well, so how did it go from doing those initial guitar amps, and were there different models, or was it pretty much the same standard? Well, I, I, had, I, had two, I had two models. I had a bass amp and a guitar amp. That's it. And I was over in, I think it was Montgomery, Alabama, to uh, the guy over there. I 
I can't remember. I think it was arts, but I wouldn't swear to it. Anyway, I, I went in there to sell the guy amplifiers. He said, well, Peavy, listen, I got amplifiers all over the place, but if you had a sound system, I'd really be interested. So I said, well, uh, I could do that. So it was about a two and a half hour drive back to Meridian. And in my head, I sit down and designed a, 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 what we then called a PA system. Mm -hmm. Today we'd call it sound reinforcement. But anyway, it basically was a four channel guitar amplifier and uh, nothing sophisticated, just four channels. And uh, we sold that uh, with a 100 watt amplifier. Uh, I think it was six, retail for 600 bucks. And, and competitively? Competitively, that probably was 30-something percent below mm -hmm. everybody else. Sure was selling a, what they called a vocal master. And at that time, this is in the late 60s, uh, the vocal master was $1,000. Hmm. Now, it's hard to kind of relate to that, but in the United States at that time, gasoline was... I think 30, 30 something cents a gallon. So a sound system, a PA system for $1,000, if you want to relate that in today's terms, just multiply it by 10. Would yeah. you pay $10,000 for a 100 watt sound system with some cheap speakers and a column? I don't think so. But that's, that's, that's what was that's going what on. That's what the option was. Huh? So, so the truth is we couldn't build them fast enough. We couldn't build them fast enough. And, uh, and this is 68? Yeah, 68, 69 in that, in that general time frame. So at that point, you're starting really trying to develop uh, a broader range of products. From well, there, you're... Well, we, we, I, I, uh, I had built tube amps, and I have decided that, that, that solid state was the future. So I started out with solid state. I had some engineering help from a company over in Alabama called Oratronics. And they were in they were in the business of making tape, recording tape. And in fact is they designed my first power amp. Mm -hmm. And I tweaked it and got it to sound like I thought it ought to sound. And we were limited. I, I didn't have any money, so the way we got going was we did a thing called factoring. And what we did is we took our invoices and we sold them to this company at a discount. Mm -hmm. So that's the way we got started. And there were, everybody and the brother were making amplifiers at that time. Martin was making amplifiers. Uh, there were all kinds of, of distributor brands. And I mean, uh, Sears and Roebuck, a big mail order company in the States, they were selling essentially uh, guitars and amplifiers made by primarily by Dan Electro. And uh, that's when, you know, we got in it. And we, 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 we kept on opening our dealers. And another thing that my dad taught me, he said, son, if you make money for your dealers, they will stick with you. If you don't, they won't. And at that time, how many dealers do you think you had? And what, what parts of the country well, had, had it expanded uh, at, out of the at, southeast? At that time, it was, it was primarily just the southeast. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was it was it was very touch and go. I never knew from one day to the next uh, whether I'd be in business. And several times I really thought I was gone. We managed to hang in there. But when all those uh, conglomerates jumped in and and bought uh, uh, Norlin, uh, which was a conglomerate, they had all kind of interest. They had a brewery, I think, in Central America. They bought. Uh, Gibson from Chicago Music, and and all these guys, th th they didn't have a passion for music. And music is all about passion. Music is one of the few things that people will fight you over. You know, there's romance and politics and religion, and maybe a few other things. But if you happen to be a fan of a particular kind of music, and somebody says, "Well, you know, people that like so and so and so and so are idiots," then you want to, you know, so. Passion, passion, passion. And one of the things that I wasn't short of was passion for the music business. I mean, it would have been nice to be profitable too, and we were to a very small extent, but I was 
essentially doing my thing. And a lot of these people uh, that I was competing with, very smart people, much smarter than me, much better educated and financed than me, but they didn't have the passion. And that's what was missing. So were you listening to your dealers and getting a lot of feedback from them? Were you Absolutely. think that's important? Absolutely. Were they asking you to broaden the product well, mix and to, to, add to, mixers? To a degree. To a degree. Um, by the early 70s, we were getting in pretty good. And, and my two major U.S. competitors, namely Gibson and Fender, they were going into their dealers and saying, well, look, for every PV amp, you've got to have one of ours. And that, in a legal term, is called tying. And it is, per se, illegal. Mm -hmm. But I've never believed in lawyers and suing people, so I just decided that I would fight fire with fire. So if they were going to use their famous name, Guitars, as leverage against the dealers, I decided I'd get in the guitar business. So you were the first one to use CNC machines in production of guitars, well, which is kind of the way it's the industry standard now. Well, did you? I, no, we, we. I started. It was a blank sheet uh, proposition. I had no idea how to make guitars, although I had been through the Fender factory, and it was far superior to what I saw at Gibson. To be honest with you, because when my dad was a music dealer, one we one uh, summer. We, the music NAM show was in Chicago. We dropped back by Kalamazoo and we went through this old junky 1898 factory that, mm -hmm. that there was so much hand stuff, it was ridiculous. Anyway, uh, I knew that wasn't the way to do it. I saw what Fender was doing and, and, and I knew that wasn't the way to do it, but I've always been fascinated with the fit and finish of a mass produced rifle. And I thought, I said, you know, Whatever machine they use to make those gun stocks mass produce them, you can't even take a business card and slip it between the, the wood and the metal. I said, I can, make, I can make guitar necks that way. So I did some research and I bought a German machine. Uh, it was called a Geiger. It would make four uh, necks about mm, 90, 95% finished in five minutes. Hmm. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody had ever done that certainly not in this country mm -hmm. so we did that uh i f saw the every, you know people talking about hand craftsmanship and fitting the reason that you have to have so much hand craftsmanship is because using the machines that they had which were not precision machines it was like pin routers which is 1890 technology if you could hold a 32nd of an inch tolerance you're pretty good mm -hmm. And the way that they worked around that is all this hand labor. But I said, well, why do that? If I could eliminate the slop some way, we could make great guitars at a reasonable price. So we were the very first people on planet Earth, as far as I know, to, to use computer-controlled machinery to cut uh, guitar bodies. Mm -hmm. And... and uh, we did that. We had a, uh, a machine uh, that we bought in, up in the Chicago area. It had three big old uh, electric motors and six, and six workstations. Three of them were cutting while we were loading. Loading the machine never stopped. We could do about 250 guitars a day, one person, eight-hour shift, and about 200 bass. The bass took longer because the linear... Uh, body shape was longer so with one with one man I could cut out 250 guitar bodies a day or about 200 bass bodies a day <laughs> everybody said it couldn't be done no you can't make you can't make guitars with computers impossible blah 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 well we weren't making guitars with computers we were making precision guitar parts down to about a thousandth of an inch and yeah. you know they make mass-produced diesel engines with computer-controlled machines. But interestingly enough, fast forward many years, I can't think of any major manufacturer or even minor manufacturer uh, that is producing guitars in series that isn't using exactly the same pioneering effort that we did. Right. You we, think you we, get enough credit for that? No. 
No. Any credit for that? We, 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 we got virtually no credit at all. In fact, is amazingly, I see companies even today advertising their CNC machines, blah, 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 blah. We did it in 1976 and 1977. In fact, is in, in 78, we were using a robot to buff necks. And we, the, our T60 and T40, which was our first basis, they were the first guitars ever made, totally made on computer controlled equipment. And that was a milestone today. Everybody's doing it. But you, you ask most people in the music business who did it first, they have no idea. So but things like the T40, T60, uh, VTMs, the Festival Series, all these are cult classics now. What do you think about that? Well, about I mean, that? you know, they were the best I could do at that time. People ask me all the time, why don't, we, why don't you do, uh, you know, reintroductions of product? And, and the reason is because what we're building today is light years better than then. Uh, in fact, as some of our competitors, most of what they're doing with their, especially with their tube stuff, is, is reintroducing what they used to do. Reissues. Mm -hmm. We don't do reissues. In fact, is the reason that people do reissues, it kind of implies that what they're doing now isn't as good as what they did. And in some cases, that's probably true. So, so we we have a, I mean, we have a lot of we have a lot of people that are asking, even for the old T60 and and T40. I mean, well, they could be developed now with well, I mean, similar uh, and well, even we some could do, improved We could do processes. something similar, but doing it exactly is. In fact, my own opinion is we can do a lot better because my 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 attention and my my focus has always been on the future, not in the past. Now, that doesn't mean I don't learn, because I've taken apart thousands and thousands of, of amplifiers and sound systems over 55 years, and you know an interesting thing, especially sometimes with guitar players, they believe in magic. And, you know, magic is what you don't understand, but I, I, I've spent literally my whole life trying to understand. Mm -hmm. And in taking apart all these uh, uh, products, mostly from my competitors, uh, I've seen some good engineering. I've seen some terrible engineering. I've seen some great craftsmanship and some awful craftsmanship. But, you know, I've never seen a piece of magic. I've never seen a piece of magic. And why is that? It's because if I see something I don't understand, I go try to learn what's there because I don't want it to be magic. I want to know. Knowledge is something that, you just got to have if you want to survive. And the fact is, I can't think of any other company in, in our end of the business that's been around longer than Peavy under the same ownership and management. You know, and we, we also has about 180 patents or so over the well, years. Well, over, over, um, over that time period, we've, we've earned about 180 patents. And, of course, you get a patent for something different. And a lot of our friendly competitors, they don't have any patents. So what are the top five patents you think you've earned and are most important to the company over the years? Oh, well, that's, 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 that's hard. Um, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting is the way that we built guitar necks. Because most uh, wooden necks have what's called a truss rod in them. And we thought that the truss rod should go in before they were carved instead of after like everybody else does. So we patented the process of putting the truss rod in before it went into our automatic machine that actually did the carving. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the way that those machines worked was very, very interesting. It had a cutter on one side, and this neck was rotating, and it had a sander on the other side. So it was cutting on one side and sanding on the other, and after four or five minutes, the neck came out of the machine and it wasn't totally finished, but it was probably 95% finished and sanded down. You'd have to have a little finish sanded, but it was pretty much the net shape that you were. And that, that was totally revolutionary. The fact is, after we got in volume production, I, uh, I bought a machine made in Austria called Zuckerman, and it carved uh, 12 necks at a time. 
12 necks at a time. In the late, in the late, um, in the late 70s, we were starting to get in really good, and the guy that helped me design those guitars, a guy named Chip Todd, he was the T in T60 and T40. He was a, he was a luthier and, and uh, a very skilled machinist, and I was paying him at that time about $37,000 or thereabouts. So Fender came in and hired him for 90 something thousand dollars. And they bought exactly identically the same machines, the same model, the same make, same everything, and never could hmm. make it work. In fact, is they closed down and moved totally out of the USA. Everything's made in Japan. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, people think that because a company has the same name, it's the same company. But it's not. I mentioned Fender, and I'll just use them as, as an example. I think they're in the fourth or fifth uh, set of hands since Leo. Um, I have had the good fortune to watch what they have done. And I've tried uh, somewhat successfully, not totally, because I've made mistakes too. I watched their mistakes and tried not to make them. And uh, another thing that I think has kept... Uh, PV going is we treat people totally different. At PV, you go to our phone directory, everybody's first name basis. You will not find coats and ties. Um, I don't want anybody to call me Mr. PV. Uh, so if you're looking for somebody in the phone directory and you don't know their first name, you can't find them. That's the way it's that's the way PV has always been, and as long as I have anything to do with it, that's the way it's going to be. So it, it's, been a, it's been an incredible uh, learning experience. When, when, I, when I graduated from college in 1965, I, I actually thought I knew something. I, I actually believed that I knew something. I was so incredibly, uh, I won't say stupid, but naive I had no idea you know they, that old saying ignorance is bliss it's totally true you were very blissful I was very blissful because I didn't know what I thought that I knew but what we what, what what I did is I kept growing and I kept learning and I I if I it I found out early on that I wasn't a good musician but on the way I found out I was pretty good at building things so what advice would you give, uh, you know, somebody trying to get into the industry now, you know, whether a musician, engineer, or, well, or the, someone? Well, the, the sad reality is parents tell their children that they can be anything they want to be. And while that may be true in the sense that they have the freedom in the USA to, to do that, the fact is, if you... Uh, go into some vocation for which you have no talent, you will not be successful. What, I've often wondered, what would have happened to me if after I got kicked out of that third band, I would just said, okay, I'm going to be a rock star anyway, and I'd gone on. I can tell you that I would be absolutely, totally, and completely unsuccessful because I've had the, I've had the uh, good fortune to interface with some of the best players on the planet. Uh, and I can tell you without fear of misleading you, if I was having to comp compete with those people in my playing talent, I would be mm -hmm. up a creek without the proverbial paddle. So I found something I was good at. I was found something that was my hobby. My hobby was my business, and there are sacrifices that you have to make, and a lot of people aren't willing to make those sacrifices. And when I started, like I said, my hours were 9 a.m. to 1 a.m. Every day, seven days a week. Uh, and it's kind of been that way ever since. I used to, I used to work until 7 or 8 o'clock uh, in the evening, go home, eat dinner, and lay out printed circuit boards until, say, 11, 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And the next day, start all over again. So what is your role today? What, what, well, what you I'm, I'm in the... I'm in the semi-retirement mode today. Uh, I feel very good 
that I have been able to, in some small way, make a difference in a lot of people's lives. Not just in, you know, this little town in Mississippi, but also across the United States and across the world. We've given people opportunities to do their thing. And in turn, we've learned a lot. We started our export program in 1972, which was another whole learning experience. And, and, and like I said, you know, education uh, is not just what you learn in school. Education is what you learn in the school of hard knocks. And that's where I've learned most of my stuff. I, I realize that I'm good at a few things and not so good at a lot of things. And I go find people that are better than me and let them do their thing. I don't tell them what to do. I'll try to keep them from making fatal errors. But generally speaking, uh, I, don't, I don't care whether it's my idea or somebody else's idea. As long as it's good, it makes a difference and it's successful. When these companies come in from outside the music industry, uh, they typically go in and they, they make foolish decisions because musicians musicians are, are, are a different breed of cat. They're not like uh, the typical. They're, they're, they're passionate, they're emotional, uh, they're creative, and you got to understand that. And, and thankful, thankful, thankfully for me, I did understand that. And I operated on that premise. And that's one of the reasons I'm still here. Uh, PV, after 55 years, is still under the same ownership, same management. Of course, people's names have changed, but I'm here, and I want my people to grow, and I want people that are that are smarter than me at what they do. I don't feel like uh, a lot of entrepreneurs have this idea that if they're good at this, they're good at everything. I call that imputed wisdom, and a lot of entrepreneurs fail because they figure they can do it better than anybody else. And in some cases, that may be true, but it's not true in all cases. So, What was your first patent? First patent was in 1964. It was on a telescoping speaker enclosure. In retrospect, it was probably impractical, hmm. but I thought it was neat. In fact, as I sent it to Gibson, I sent it to Fender, they both turned it down. I applied for jobs at both. They both turned me down. That's <laughs> that's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm still here. Well, uh, that may have but, been a good but, thing, I guess. But, well, I've watched a bunch of smart people come and go. Uh, you know, sometimes smart isn't necessarily your IQ. It has to do with a lot of things. Uh, so uh, whatever, whatever happened, I was able to survive. And many of my competitors, they're, they're gone. Bud Ross died a year or so ago, custom. Of course, Jim Marshall died about five, six years ago. Marshall, uh, Mr. Fender, who for many years was my idol. I thought that he had really invented a lot of that stuff, and he did some. But uh, I read a book on uh, Paul Bigsby, and it's incredible the, the number of innovations that Paul Bigsby did that, frankly, Leo copied. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not saying that I haven't borrowed ideas, but if I borrow an idea, I'm not going to claim it was my idea. I'm just going to borrow it because, you know, sometimes you have to do that. But, uh, you know, to me, happiness is never having to say I'm sorry, although sometimes PV is just like any other company. We, you know, we have people, and people sometimes make mistakes. Uh, so what product was your greatest disappointment? That one's easy. We built the best drums in the world. The sad reality is the drums today from all the major manufacturers use exactly identically the same techniques and technology as drums did 100 years ago. Our drums sounded better. They were better in, in, in every way, albeit they looked slightly different. We've had some of the top drummers in the world say that's the best sounding kit they'd ever played. And I mm -hmm. said, okay, let's, let's, uh, we'd like you to endorse it. No, I can't do it. Why not? Well, because I, they don't look right. What does that mean? Well, that's the way it was. 
and I was disappointed. I, I didn't know drummers were so stuck in their ways that that they're not looking for a better sound because I come from the sound end of things. And our drums, our snare, it, it was it, the 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 impact, the percussion was so loud, it would actually hurt your ears. But they were built a totally different way. And, and so with the bass drum and tom-toms, uh, our shells were uh, less than an eighth of an inch thick, 080. Nobody had ever done that before. And you couldn't do it unless you did it the way we did it, which happened to be patented. So. And did you greet, you buy the machinery off the shelf, or did you have to make it yourself? Well, a lot of it. We, we actually used uh, some of our guitar machines to do the, do the uh, what we call a radial bridge. And today I would probably do it differently, but that's the way we did it then. But that should have gone. It didn't. And I'm still, I'm still disappointed about it. And in fact, is I may try it again someday. Okay. So 55 years, what, what would you have done differently? Well, it depends on what day you ask me. Some days I wish that I'd never, never seen the amplifier business, <laughs> the music business. Uh, it just seems sometimes that whatever you do, somebody is not going to like it. And I try to please as many people as I can, knowing that there's no way that you can please everybody. But to me, happiness is never having to say I'm sorry. When I build an amplifier or a speaker cabinet or a loudspeaker, in fact, is that's, we didn't mention that, the, the weakest link in any sound system, from a guitar amplifier to the largest sound system you can imagine, the weak link is always the loudspeaker. And when I started getting into the bigger, more powerful sound systems, I went to all the major producers, to, to uh, JBL and to Alltech Lansing and to Electro Voice and Gauss and all those companies, I tried to tell them what we needed and they wouldn't listen. So in utter desperation in the mid-70s, I um, started a speaker factory. As a matter of fact, I started a speaker factory and a guitar factory in the same year, in the early 70s. And that was uh, a classic case of biting off more than you can chew. Mm. And we almost, we almost crashed and burned, but thankfully not. But we built the best speakers that we could. Can you blow them out? Yeah. But the difference with our speakers and everybody else's, if you blow a speaker, you take out three bolts, put on another cone basket assembly, and boom, you're back in business. Mm -hmm. We tried to patent that. Patent office says, no, you can't patent that because there have been transducers with replaceable voice coils and, and diaphragms talking about high frequency. I said, yeah, but this is a cone speaker. Said, they said, it doesn't matter. It's, it's the same. It's a, same, it's a transducer. You can't, you can't patent that. Mm -hmm. So our Black Widow and our Scorpion product lines uh, have field replaceable basket assemblies, cones. And we couldn't patent it. Our competitors could copy it. But they don't. And the reason for it, it costs more money, probably 6 or $8 per speaker, to do it that way. Actually, more than that. But <laughs> so the, the, the reality is uh, we did things because it was the way it was supposed to be. We came out with our CS800, and God, we probably made over a million of them. They're everywhere. They're tanks. They had 24 output devices. You see them in smoky clubs. You see them in Mexico. You see them everywhere. And after all these years, they're still, still running. So... Uh, We've done a lot of we've done a lot of, of very interesting things because to me, I want to be the best. I don't want to be the cheapest. We're not the cheapest. I mean, it, there was many years before we, uh, for imports really were that competitive. But of course now, uh, you know what happens to most electronics? It's mm -hmm. come from someplace else. But the reality is. We, we attacked the areas that needed attention, loudspeakers. See, e even today, loudspeakers are still the weakest link. Even a premium cone-type loudspeaker is only about 4% efficient. So you put in, say, 100 watts, you, you 
convert four watts to, to sound, the rest of it's heat. And at 100 watts, it's not a big deal, but at 1,000 watts, it is a big deal because you're talking hair dryers. So we, we, we did a lot of things, a lot of patented things. We, we, we went to neodymium, and neodymium is a wonderful material, but it has, a, it has one very bad fault, and that is if the temperature gets high enough, the neodymium will demagnetize itself. Mm -hmm. So we have a patented uh, heat sink assembly on our speakers with, a, with, with air flowing through, and it's pumping its own air to keep the neomagnet because the, the, the hotter the voice coil gets, the, the impedance goes up and the output goes down. Some people call it power compression or whatever, but when, when most materials heat up, their electrical resistance goes up. And you may start the evening with a speaker that has eight ohm, but you know, two hours uh, or even 30 minutes in the performance, you may be looking at a 10 or 12 ohm speaker instead of an 8 ohm speaker so the output you know drops mm -hmm. but there will come a time if you keep on putting more and more power it's going to it's going to zap the speaker because materials we use the best epoxies we use the best things but but it's it ours takes more power than anybody out there and that converts into sound and another thing you know if you're a musician and you're on, fa you're on stage and your equipment fails, uh, you're embarrassed. Yeah. We've just wounded your ego. Mm. You know, if a, if, a, if a piece of gear is in somebody's uh, living room and it fails, well, that's bad. But your ego doesn't get wounded in front of, you know, a thousand fans or a hundred or, or whatever. Same deal in a church. We do a lot of sound systems in churches. And we cover. We we still make tube amps. We we make solid state amps. We were one of the first to, to do class D amplifiers many years ago. Uh, PB has had so many innovations. It's 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 crazy. And so, what are some of the great new products uh, you look forward to taking out well, in the future? Well, one of the things that one of the things that we have had to to deal with is the evolution of power devices. Power is where, you know, that's where the... What it's all about. It's where the rubber meets the road. You can have the best sounding thing in the world. If it's not reliable, mm. what good is it? But the devices, like when we first started making Class D amplifiers 25 years ago, the output devices simply weren't available. We, we used the best that we could, but the failure rate was more than we had anticipated. Um, but today, it's... It's pretty reliable. I mean, the devices are there, the technology is there, and uh, the fact that almost all of our competitors, let's say, that makes guitar amps, I don't know any of them that make their own speakers. Mm. They're off-the-shelf speakers, and we buy some off-the-shelf from, from Eminence and Celestian and some of those people, but the fact of the matter is the, the, the easiest way to get better performance is in a loudspeaker. Unfortunately, that's the most expensive way. Power, we, we, the biggest power amp we build right now is 7,000 watts. We can't find a single speaker that will carry that amount of power. Power isn't a problem anymore. We're back to Mach 1, a speaker that will take the power. Because if the speakers are so complicated because there's three things that you want with the speaker. You want efficiency, you want bandwidth, and you want power handling. And you can get one, but you give up the other two. If you want more power, put bigger wire, bigger voice call, whatever, that's so that the moving mass gets heavier, and the more mass you have, the more inertia you have, and the more inertia you have, the less efficiency you have, the less bandwidth you have. So, well, okay, to, 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 to make it more efficient, you lighten up the voice call, but then there goes your power. So we keep chasing our tail around. The, the, the weakest link is the loudspeaker. That's why we make our own. All right. Well, I think we're coming up at the end of our time. Is there any uh, other words of wisdom to, to dole well, out to Well, people? you know, it's back to that old adage, you get what you pay for. And if you ask the average person, 
do you believe that when you purchase a piece of gear, you get what you pay for? Most people will say, absolutely, absolutely. And I think most people probably on the surface believe that. And when, I, when I'm talking about that with people, I say, well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever paid, you know, big bucks for a concert ticket and you went to the show and it sucked? And almost universally they say, well, yeah. Well, did you get what you paid for? And the answer is probably not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. See, because sadly, a lot of, a lot of musicians think that all companies are alike. All companies are not alike. If I said all bass players in Germany are just alike, that, that, that's a stupid statement. It isn't true. Well, all manufacturers are not alike. It depends on how they're set up, who owns them, what profit they have. I mean, it's a, it's a whole thing. And, and you, don't, you, you have to look at many, many factors. But with equipment, you don't always get what you pay for. Some people charge ridiculous prices for tired old technology. Mm -hmm. Guitar players especially believe want to believe in magic. There is no magic. I've never seen any magic in the music and audio business. Never seen a piece of magic. Some engineering, good engineering, bad. There is no magic. Guitar players want to believe that there is an old hermit that winds pickups by the light of the moon and soak them overnight to give them soul. No. That's a bunch of BS. That's a bunch of BS. Uh, don't don't take the dream away. Come on. This well, is there's nothing wrong with having dreams as long as it's based in reality. And you know, let's a solid body guitar. What is it? A piece of wood, a little metal, a few coils of wire, some magnets. Not worth five, six, eight thousand dollars. Give me a break. I've seen old guitars at guitar shows all rusty and just awful sell for fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, and I'm thinking, huh? because they had soul. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Reality is everything is different. Every company is different. Every person is different. So, uh, you know, I think business is kind of like a rodeo. The one that can stay on the pony the longest wins. So and you're not ready to hang up your rock and roll shoes I'm not just ready yet. to hang them up yet, but at the tender age of 78, it probably won't be much longer. All but right. I, I don't ever want to quit quit. Never. Uh, I, I love to tinker. I go back in my little workshop, uh, and my wife says, what in the world are you doing back here? And she doesn't understand. I'm back there tinkering. And how many guitars have you built in the last year in the last year i probably built 30 40 you know just because on weekends you know i don't golf i don't fish i don't hunt i tinker and when's the last time you played guitar oh seriously i don't remember well so do you when you finish assembling one of these masterpieces that you've come up with here lately you, do you play well, I mean, and check I, it out I, yeah i check them out but i mean as far as going on stage i'd be ashamed to go on stage and play anymore but I, I tried to show somebody how to play johnny b good about 10 or 12 years ago and I totally embarrassed myself because i had <laughs> totally forgotten you know they say a guitar is like a woman if you don't spend time with it it'll leave you and believe me that's true i see i see but it, it it's been fun uh, it's been fun. And, you know, as human beings, about the best we can ever hope to do is to make a difference. And I hope, I hope, and I believe that I have made a difference, not just in the technology of music and musical instruments, but in giving people opportunities, opportunities here at the factory and opportunities, you know, all, I've had many, many dealers say, well, you know, I sent my kids to college selling PV equipment. That, that's... That is a is a pretty neat thing for somebody to say to you. Well, I think it's safe to say that you've certainly made a difference uh, in our industry and to 
many people all around the world well, because the products are, are sold in hundreds of countries around well, the world and uh and now they're calling the or their fans are calling yep well with that i think we can call it a wrap we appreciate your time and uh hope you learned a thing or two yeah <laughs>